Hey, everybody, Dr. Rob Silverman here. It's a pleasure. I hope you all had a great weekend. Monday, start the week off right. We're going to be talking about a very interesting topic. Um, it's based on an article that I saw uh, last week. Um, it, it really was a breakthrough article in that uh, it was in Gut Magazine, and it spoke about the gut microbiota's composition and how it actually reflected the disease severity and dysfunctional immune responses in patients that actually had COVID-19. So once again, we're seeing that the gut is the epicenter of your health. 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. It's where your macro and micronutrients are absorbed. So it's a critical element to keep good gut health. There's so much discussion about uh, COVID-19 on what to do. Do we take a vaccine? Do we not? Which one do we take? Well, it's a great conversation and certainly a very hot uh, and in some ways, a very divisive conversation. But the conversation that everybody should be talking about is how to keep their gut healthy, how to keep our immune system working well, and how do we stay healthy? The data is in. So let's go through some of the data about how the bacteria, the gut microbial uh, composition is a critical element to our overall health. This was from a two hospital study where they took both blood and stool samples. Uh, they got a hundred uh, COVID-19 positive patients and they compared and contrasted with 78 healthy controls. They did uh, blood markers, or as you it's been called plasma markers, looking for the concentration of inflammatory cytokines and other inflammatory blood markers. I'll talk a lot about cytokines. Cytokines have come to the forefront. As everybody knows, too many cytokines can be very infl inflammatory, leading you down a path of what we call the cytokine storm. So let's look at the results. The gut microbial uh, composition was significantly altered in patients with COVID-19 versus the control. Not a surprise. Several gut commensals. Now, I've used that term before. A gut commensal actually means a positive bacteria in the gut that prevents colonization and invasion of pathogens. So these gut commensals, which have known immunomodulatory potential, were underrepresented in patients up to 30 days after disease resolution. So even though the disease, the COVID left, if you will, you still were showing a damage to your immune system. So many of my patients have called me up and said, yeah, I got COVID. Um, I'm not sure, I'm not feeling well, or is it on its way out? I've got diarrhea. I've got stomach upset. My father who got, has COVID, uh, he's gotten over it. Thank you all. Many people emailed me and uh, DM me. I do appreciate your concern. I really do. Um, went to the doctor and the doctor said he had a stomach flu. I'm like, dad, you know, these are signs and symptoms of COVID-19. When again, 80% of your immune cells are in your gut. I can't emphasize your gut health and your gut's response to shed the virus via giving you diarrhea. And those blood markers were interesting in that there were elevated concentrations of the cytokines, which we talked about, which are protein enzymes that typically, typically not always involve the elevation of inflammatory markers. C-reactive protein, which is a tissue inflammatory marker. Lactate dehydrogenase, which is when it's elevated is a sign of tissue damage or disease. Aspartate aminotransferase is usually indicative of liver disease and can also imply possibly heart or kidney and gamma glutamase transferase, which can be liver or bile duct. So you're seeing tissue, liver, heart, gut. What are we talking about? All organs that have ACE2 receptor sites. And as we all know, those ACE2 receptor sites are what is attacked where that spike protein comes in and just clamps in. And there are areas that have reservoirs for the virus to stay. So it's not really a surprise to see these blood markers indicate organ inflammation. This is not just a flu. So there's specific microbial bat patterns that correlate with disease severity and those bacterial imbalances may account for what we're now referring to as the long COVID or the long haulers. So you're having symptomology well after your fever and the virus replication has abated posing a major issue. So interestingly enough, those long haulers and the long COVID, that's what really concerns me most about COVID-19. Being home for three, four, five days, running a fever, not necessarily a problem, but the fact that this virus is so 
potent in that it can stay in the body. It can adversely affect the central nervous system. It can adversely affect multiple organs and really is showing to damage the gut where 80% of immune cells are in your gut. So the conclusion to the study in gut, which was in January 11th, 2021, is as follows. I'm gonna take it right from the article. The associations between the gut and microbial uh, composition, levels of cytokines and inflammatory markers in patients with COVID-19 suggest the gut microbiome is involved in a magnitude of COVID-19 severity, possibly via modulating the host immune responses. So the composition in, in essence, let me unpack that a little for you, is really speaking to the idea of the elevation of inflammatory markers and cytokines actually damaging the microbiome and not allowing your normal immune system functioning through your gut to function well. Taking to the next step, the gut microbial dysbiosis after disease resolution could contribute to persistent symptoms, highlighting the need to understand how the gut microorganisms are involved in inflammation in COVID-19. So it's resonating what's going on in your gut. What a great test. So if you go to the doctor and he could test your, your ecosystem, would you take the test? Without question. So the summary, if you will, um, I wanted to put a summary together on basically what we just talked about. So the findings in this study, this is a breakthrough study, suggest that the depletion of immunomodulatory gut microorganisms actually contributed to severe COVID-19 disease. A dysbiotic gut microbiota that persists after disease resolution could be a factor in developing persistent symptoms and or multi-system inflammation syndromes that occur in patients after clearing the virus. Ultimately, bolstering of beneficial gut species that were depleted in COVID-19 could serve as what we'd like to refer to as a novel avenue to mitigate the severity of this disease underscoring the importance of managing patients' gut microbiota during and after COVID-19. So we wanna fix your gut. We wanna get those probiotics in there. Um, we wanna make sure, do you have the guts to be healthy? What have you done for your guts lately? They're very important concepts pertaining to the, your gut health and COVID-19. It's another study that I looked up because this really caught my attention. Um, of course, anytime I see the gut, I get truly excited. This article was um, put out in November of 2020. It talked about the alterations of the gut microbiota in patients with coronavirus disease 2019, COVID-19, or H1N1 influenza. There was a cross-section study. There were 30 patients that had COVID-19, 24 patients had H1N1, and they had 30 healthy controls. They wanted to identify the differences in the gut microbiota, and the results were as follows. They compared the healthy control to the COVID-19 patients. The COVID-19 patients had significantly reduced bacterial diversity. The diversity or the biodiversity in your gut is a critical element. That is our superpower in our gut. If we have the same bacteria, even if it's a good bacteria, we're not as potent if we have multiple bacteria. Think of a colorful salad. That's what you want your gut, to have a multitude of different species and strains. The COVID-19 patients also had significantly higher relative abundance of opportunistic pathogens. So a regular person, COVID-19, less biodiversity in COVID-19, more opportunistic pathogens. In addition, they had a lower relative abundance of beneficial symbionts. Those symbiosis, if you will, is critical because you want the balancing of good and bad bacteria and you want them to live in a harmonious situation. So what you're seeing here is even in a healthy control versus COVID in an uh, earlier study, you're seeing that COVID-19 unsettles the ecosystem in the gut. They then compared COVID-19 patients with H1N1 patients. The H1N1 patients had even a lower biodiversity, but they had a different microbiota composition. Their microbiomes were different. It's not the same flu. The conclusion was as follows. The gut microbiome signature of patients with COVID-19 is different than the H1N1 patients and different, clearly both are different than a healthy control. Therefore, the study truly suggested the potential value of the gut microbiota as a diagnostic biomarker and a therapeutic target for COVID-19. So, 
Wouldn't that be interesting? When's the last time you went to the doctor and he tested your gut? When's the last time you went to the doctor and he talked about your gut health? Well, without question, these two articles really allow that theme of how important the gut is to resonate without question. There were some alterations in another study. It was a small pilot study of 15 people in the gut microbiota of patients with COVID-19 during the time of hospitalization. That pilot study with 15 patients of COVID-19 found persistent alterations in the fecal microbiome during the time of hospitalization compared with those who are healthy controls. The fecal microbiota alterations associated with fecal levels of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 severity so it was clear to these people in this study, and this was in gastroenterology 2020, this, there were strategies to alter the intestinal microbiota might reduce disease severity. So once again, you're seeing another study piggybacking all the other studies that what's critical is your ecosystem and the type of bacteria you have, the amount and the diversity. So when people said it was a lung disease, the lung got attacked as a byproduct of your immune system and probably a byproduct of the failure of your gut to help you. So one of the things, the one simple vitamin I want everybody to start to take, just one. I'm not going to give you the whole plethora of different nutrients that I typically talk about. I'm just going to talk about one. And I'm going to talk about one that has really come into news. Dr. Anthony Fauci has even talked about it. We're going to talk about D3. D3, if you take D3, you must take it with K2. It's very synergistic to take it together. Let's talk about why D3. Some studies came out about D3. Everybody knows that D3 is a pro-hormone. It puts the brakes on your immune system. It's great for musculoskeletal. It's great for bone health. This was sort of a breakthrough study to speak about the idea of an increased vitamin D levels was showing positive changes on the composition of the actual gut microbiome positive effects on autoimmunity by positively changing the microbiome in autoimmune patients. Now, for me, autoimmunity is the fact that we have what we call intestinal or increased intestinal permeability. Increased intestinal permeability typically comes from a dysbiosis, a leveling of good and bad bacteria. It can also come from something called L a release of LPS, endotoxemia. Autoimmunity is when things, especially foods, large undigested food particles pass the intestinal barrier, which is razor thin, and your body attacks it, gets confused in its attack and starts attacking structures like fingers, organs, and the such. A lot of this is predicated on your gut's microbiome and speaking to the idea that vitamin D had a positive change on the composition and a positive outcome with those who have autoimmunity. So the conclusion to the study was as follows. It was evident that immune system and microbiome are interconnected and that vitamin D is a critical intermediary player in this dynamic. So if you wanna connect your systems and the body's all interconnected, vitamin D is a critical element. Vitamin D supplementation is also a gut microbiota modifier. Um, the supplementation is significantly increasing the gut microbial diversity. It elicits beneficial effect by impro improving health, promoting probiotics, the taxa in the area. It also improved clinical biomarkers for the kidney and the liver. Essentially, vitamin D was changing once again in a different study, and it was a follow-up study, the microbiome and the ecosystem, allowing it to be, of course, healthy. Um, some other studies that were interesting on vitamin D status in COVID-19, they looked at 216 patients that were hospitalized. 82% of hospitalized patients were vitamin D deficient. Whereas they looked at COVID-19 patients that were positive, but not in a hospital, 197, and they all lived in the same geographic area because geographic area is a critical element to vitamin D levels. I live in the Northeast. That latitude allows me or unfortunately has me at a, a lower vitamin D level if I didn't supplement as religiously as I do. They were all in this study of 197 people of similar age and sex, 47% of them were vitamin D deficient. So vitamin D deficiency, without question, leads you down a path of getting a positive COVID-19 test, but especially the hospitalization, as Dr. Anthony Fauci said, D3 will help you avoid hospitalization. In reference to the pure coronavirus, 
Vitamin D has shown to reduce infection and has a positive impact on COVID-19. What happened was it showed that lymphocytes were tied to a decrease in the cytokine storm. Lymphocytes are B and T cells. They are coming out, your antibodies are coming out, decreasing precipitously your cytokine storm. Patients older than 40 with sufficient levels of vitamin D were more than 51% less likely to die. That death, that death number now is one in 848 Americans have died because of COVID-19. So it's a real thing to discuss the de certainly the death, not maybe not the death rate, but certainly the death per pendency. And I wanna end before we open up for questions that we have some questions, correct? I want to end. Essentially, I just want to talk about a couple of positives of uh, vitamin D3 and taking it with K2. Vitamin D decreases inflammation. It, active, it aids in the activation of autophagy. It regulates mitochondrial function and induces immune intolerance. So therefore, I'm a big proponent, if you will, of taking vitamin. I just said D3. There's a whole litany. If you're interested, we can answer. And I see a lot of cool. We really hit it today. Um, so let's see what we have here. ACE2 gets down regulated during infection, but essential to recovery. That's right, Bob Hoffman. We love it. Did you see any trends in malabsorption and unintentional weight loss? You know what? Didn't see anything with that in reference to malabsorption or unintentional weight loss. But if you think about it, if you have diarrhea, you're losing all your nutrients. You're not absorbing. You're flushing things through your body. So I think that I've had patients who've said they've gone through the COVID um, timeframe and they've lost some weight. Um, I lost Susan Booker's and now I'm not moving. Oh, there we go. What can be taken to balance this? I, is that the only question from Susan? Suzanne Brooker? Um, that was the first question that she put, yes. What can be taken to balance this? Um, I guess she's asking me what can be taken to balance uh, the COVID-19. So uh, anyway, so here would be one of my um, protocols. It would be melatonin. It would be uh, vitamin D3. It would be zinc, vitamin C, pro-resolving mediators, and um, PEA. Are we good? Okay. Just a little technical help here. Um, LinkedIn user, ordering those pricey probiotics that I can put on my wait list back into my Amazon cart. Probiotics are a great choice. But the bottom line is you want to take a good quality probiotic. I don't know if the commercial ones are that good. My um, I can give you some options and different genus, species, and strain. Probiotics are not the an just the answer. They are part of a great answer. But you also want probiotics with prebiotics because prebiotics feed the probiotic in the gut to allow for what we call a postbiotic. A good example of a postbiotic that will have health-promoting uh, consequences would be a short-chain fatty acid like butyrate. Uh, that's right. Uh, we've got Bob Hoffman, Robert Hoffman talking about D3. We need magnesium without question. Magnesium is, a, is one of uh, the most efficient minerals in America today. Most Americans are deficient in magnesium. So there's a few different types of magnesiums that I like. I like magnesium bisglycinate for overall muscle health, magnesium l for brain health. Um, Sarah Moore, diversity of uh, plant foods is the best way to increase microbiota of the microbiome diversity without question. Love that, love my plant foods. So my diet is always a flex TRE. I believe in the flexibility of eating different foods, starting with a plant-based diet in a time-restrictive eating um, uh, framework. Sure, Brittany and Robert, please DM me about biotics and D3, would love to. Guess more fiber wouldn't hurt. That's right, fiber's a great choice. Fiber's a great prebiotic. So you want both soluble and insoluble fibers. Magnesium, H, they asked, um, what's the, do oh, I, I moved up. I'm sorry about that. What's the dose of D3 and K2, please? Real simple. Uh, about 5,000 I use of D3 with about 60 uh, of uh, K2. It's what they measure in your blood, and I'm going to be coming out uh, using a new blood test to be measuring. It's funny you mentioned that in March. I'll have a blood test in my office. That'll measure omega-3, omega-6, and vitamin D. I think we're good. I think those are the questions. So it's been my pleasure again.
We love using this StreamYard. It enables us to do uh, multiple platforms at one time. Big shout out to my friend. I know he's watching, Asher Allen. I know he's on. I got a text from him. Um, feel free, ask a question. We'll go check it. Let's start that conversation on LinkedIn. Let's start that thread on Facebook. Please share this with everybody that you can. This is vital information. The takeaway today, the key takeaway is you've got to take care of your gut if you want to decrease your incidence of COVID-19 and your severity of COVID-19. And well, we're getting a lot of thank yous. I appreciate that. Working hard to bring you. We'll be back. Uh, we'll be back on Wednesday. We're going to talk a little bit about concussion because something happened over the weekend that I want to address. So it's been my pleasure. Dr. Rob Silverman, always yours in hell.